Well, welcome back to episode five of An Achievable Dream, where we are going to attempt to define the attributes of a well-founded expedition yacht. We started back in early 2021 with episode one, taking you up the 1,000 mile offshore portion along the west coast of the United States between Southern California and up to the Pacific Northwest. Then in part one and two of episode two, we discuss the importance of weather routing and vessel preparedness to help ensure that this offshore passage is safe and enjoyable. In episode three, we took you from Blaine, Washington through the Inside Passage along Vancouver Island, the central British Columbia coast to Alaska, with stops at Ketchikan, Petersburg, Tracy's Arm, Juneau, and out icy straits to Glacier Bay. In episode four, we take you on a 350 mile passage across the Gulf of Alaska to Prince William Sound, down the Kenai Peninsula to Kodiak Island and the Alaska Peninsula. Now in episode five, we get back to the more nuanced detail that goes into pulling off these expeditions, which all begins with defining the attributes of an expedition yacht. So let's start with a definition. So from my perspective, an expedition yacht is a purpose-built, full displacement heavy vessel capable to cruise long distances to remote locations of the world with the endurance to safely handle rough weather, to cross large bodies of water, and to stay on scene for long periods of time. They are set up to be able to perform much of their own maintenance on board and to accomplish all these tasks in the relative comfort of a safe and stable vessel. They possess the attributes of range, endurance, sea kindliness, reliability, versatility, freedom and autonomy, and are able to efficiently operate and function across a wide geographic spectrum. These vessels are purpose-built to be self-sufficient and carry guests on a regular basis. Plus, the boat also needs to carry ample food, supplies, tools, spare parts, and tenders for shore excursions. These vessels are able to efficiently resupply with fuel, water, and provisions, and they need to be capable to launch and retrieve a tender in other than dead calm or ideal conditions. Their tenders need to be able to ferry passengers to and from shore, to conduct extended fishing or diving excursions, if those are your things, to act as a pilot boat, and to conduct local exploration within five or a 10 mile radius. These yachts are for serious, passionate, and dedicated mariners who desire to take the road less traveled. The scope of this video is mostly targeting boats between 55 and 90 feet and between 60 to 200 tons. These are somewhat arbitrary size constraints as I have taken our 49 foot catch rigged sailboat, which weighed only 25 tons, on multiple trips from Southern California to Alaska and from Florida to Maine. That said, in terms of the bulk of my lifetime experience, it is better that I stay in my own lane and defer to others with more experience outside this designated size range and tonnage. So, with so many boats to choose from, how do you decide on the right boat that will meet your needs? It all starts with planning and conceptualizing. There is no quick, easy, or magic formula for making this complicated investment decision. Those who rush this process are usually the same people who end up changing boats every few years, spending inordinate sums of money in making repairs, retrofitting, paying brokerage commissions, which more often than not ends up as an extremely expensive mistake in terms of both time and money. I'm constantly amazed at the number of people I have spoken with that embark on this process without ever considering or thinking through what the boat's mission statement is. It's a bit like starting a business without a business plan, or to put it in nautical terms, attempting to chart a course without first knowing the destination. Perhaps Yogi Berra nailed it when he said, 
If you don't know where you are going, you're going to end up someplace else. Unless you have been at this for many years, there is a steep learning curve. Speaking from personal experience, we don't know what we don't know. This lack of knowledge, along with a touch of hubris, can all too easily get us into trouble. I had spent over 20 years sailing and about 15 years as a custom home builder, which mistakenly led me to believe that these skill sets would be transferable over to buying, building, and operating a serious expedition yacht. It turned out not to be the case, and 30 years later, every day, I am still learning and reminded of what I don't know. Planning is not only essential, but I guarantee you that the time you invest up front will pay huge dividends over the life of your boat in terms of your ultimate cost, your overall enjoyment, and the experience you come away with. Without a clear plan and a mission statement, you are really just hoping that things will work out. I'd like to begin this process by both recognizing and acknowledging that there are legitimate objective and subjective considerations. Let's start with the more subjective, emotional, and visceral side of making this decision. In some ways, this is far easier to understand and more relatable. It's a key component which also underscores the passion that will be necessary to both sustain you and keep you connected to this process. Long-range expedition trawlers come in many flavors and styles, each with their own no-nonsense, rugged design and hopefully exceptional build quality. For every one of these, there are 10 imitation expedition boats. Be careful of marketing hype and curb appeal, as you simply cannot judge this book by its cover. You will often see boats that are described as a, quote, trawler and, quote, expedition yacht in their marketing materials. Nine out of 10 times, these are imposters masquerading as true expedition yachts. This is not to say that anything is wrong or negative about these boats. They are built for a different application. Example of these types of boats might be Beneteau's Swift Trawler, Serena's Expedition Yacht, the Marlow Voyager, which claims to render traditional displacement cruisers obsolete, or Nevada's Fast Trawler. These boats are fine for near coastal day trips and local cruising when you can pick your weather, cruise on an inside passage or an intercoastal waterway on protected waters, or while dining on the aft deck in a place like Martha's Vineyard or San Tropez. But these are not viable as a true offshore boat, except in settled weather, when talking to the salesman in the showroom, at cocktail parties, or when tied to the dock. Their engines, rudders, and stabilizers are all sized for running at speed. Even though their range will increase when you slow down, so will your maneuverability, stability, and control especially in following seas. Speed essentially is a function of weight and horsepower. So by necessity, these are made of lightweight, usually cord composite hulls. They have limited tankage, storage, no ballast other than for trim. They have large gas guzzling, high horsepower engines, low endurance, limited interior living space, oversized windows, and sometimes even sliding glass doors. They are simply not designed to operate far offshore or in rough seas. These boats excel at moving short distances in settled weather at high speeds while converting thousands of gallons of diesel into exhaust fumes and soaking up any excess cash. These are fine for 95% of the boating community, but should not be confused with a serious expedition boat which is what we will attempt to detail in this video. This will be more of a thought-provoking guide to help you evaluate whether the boat you might be considering will meet the moment for your intended adventure. It seems like I say this in every video, that there is no one right way to approach selecting, buying, building, or refitting a boat, and no boat will ever meet every one of your objectives. Our goal is to provide you with a contextual framework to help you make sense, prioritize, and evaluate many of these subtle yet very different attributes 
to assist in your coming to a thoughtful decision. On that note, let's get started. I would say that item one has to be the mission statement. It all starts by developing a clear mission statement, which lays out with some specificity where you are headed and how the boat needs to function for you and your family. This does not ensure that you'll make all the right decisions, but it will go a long way to help that you avoid making a major mistake. Your mission statement needs to consist of six items. First, create a three, five, and seven to 10 year cruising plan. Next, decide what cruising destinations you may wanna visit. We have all met people who wanna sail around the world, explore the Mediterranean, visit the South Pacific, or transit the Northwest Passage. Others wanna cruise between Seattle and Alaska, or Florida and the Bahamas. The former requiring a much different boat than the latter. The type of expedition boat also varies depending if you will be cruising in high latitudes like Greenland, Iceland, the UK, Norway, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, the Great Lakes, Alaska, or down south along the Chilean coast. The central latitudes, on the other hand, would include much of the United States, Mediterranean, and presents a very different set of challenges, as will cruising in the more southern latitudes, like the Caribbean, Central America, or the South Pacific. Of equal importance is not to overlook where you anticipate wintering over with the boat, as even the best built and operated expedition vessels can't sustain more than about six months of continuous cruising without starting to eat into principle. We've wintered over in Southern California, Florida, New York, London, Malta, and Israel, each having special needs and considerations. Third, think about what is the realistic number of family members, guests, pets, and crew you envision. This impacts everything from the physical size of the boat to the number of staterooms, size of the galley, the volume of storage you will re require, the layout of the boat, tenders, etc. Fourth is to be thoughtful about age-related concerns, such as the general health, fitness, mobility of you and your crew. This will also have a practical impact on such other items as the complexity of the boat systems, the design or selection of tenders, dock and tender access, deck equipment, and more. Fifth, think about how many months per year you envision living on board the boat. Sixth, you need to make a realistic assessment of the time, interest, and ability to perform routine and specialized maintenance, diagnostics, and make repairs. This will bear directly on your need and assessment for backup systems and or crew. The next item after creating your mission plan is to clearly enumerate your personal preferences. I've intentionally moved this section up towards the beginning of this process because very often identifying and being clear about your personal preferences ahead of time helps to narrow your field of view in terms of any specific features which are critical in your decision making. Here are just a few examples that were key to me making our decision as we went through this process. So for me, having a full stand-up engine room, which meant full stand-up head height from the front of the engine room all the way to the back was critical. We knew that we would both need and want a full-sized workbench, sink, and adequate tool storage. Next was a large pilot house with a pilot berth, dinette table that could seat four, a full-size chart table, a desk and storage area. Third, I wanted a large family-style galley with a breakfast bar and dining area that could seat eight. I knew I wanted the ability to carry at least two tenders, one large and one small, one or two motor scooters, an adequate sized crane davit system, and the ability to carry and deploy a Mediterranean boarding ramp. For safety and peace of mind and reduce the need of crew, I wanted also a bow and stern thruster. 
We wanted a standard size washer and dryer, which can be removed for service or replacement without having to use a chainsaw to cut it up and take it out in pieces. Other considerations could be for things like specific activities, such as diving, fishing, chartering, etc. Next, let's address the elephant in the room, namely the budget. It would be ideal if we didn't have to let the right side of the menu dictate what it is that we are looking for. But unless you are a Russian oligarch, it's both a reality and a limiting factor. There are several areas to consider when it comes to your budget, including the initial purchase price, refitting the boat, and or changes you wish to make to the vessel, its operating cost, the maintenance cost, and how much you can expect to recoup upon resale of the boat. So in terms of your initial purchase price, you will want to establish your minimum maximum target price range. There is no point in looking at a 90 foot expedition yacht if it isn't going to be in the budget. Similarly, those individuals who are overly fixated on getting a good deal invariably end up shooting themselves in the foot. They are so focused on the right side of the menu that they end up buying the wrong boat, wasting months, if not years of their lives and are hugely disappointed, frustrated, and spend far more than they had originally anticipated had they taken a more realistic approach. Next, consider what the initial refit might cost. If you are building a boat, set aside a 10% contingency. You'll need every penny of it. If you are buying a used boat, be thoughtful about setting aside an adequate reserve for any refit, recommissioning, and or personalization. I have lost count of the number of people I have known who were told by reputable shipyards that their refit would cost a certain amount and how long it would take, only to discover the hard way that it took five times longer and literally cost six times as much as they were quoted. Believe me when I tell you that you do not want to end up in this category. The third item to consider are operating costs. Think about the boat's operational affordability by creating an estimated budget for its operation. Items in the operations category are dependent on the boat's mission statement and include the usual suspects of fuel, lubrication, filters, insurance, dockage, routine running maintenance, and repairs. Next, be mindful of the time, effort, and cost involved to properly maintain a boat. After 30 years, my assessment is that in the best case, meaning that you are doing some maintenance while cruising, you will need one month of downtime for every month spent cruising. Naturally, many people try to cruise nine or 10 months a year, but it's an expensive prospect and it usually ends up by eating into the principal value of the boat. It's a lot less expensive to maintain a boat than it is to repair or refit one. A few other items to keep in mind are haul outs, bottom paint, zincs, bright work, waxing, polishing, painting, running gear, engines and generators, and bridge electronics. Fourth would be amortization. To smooth out your annual expenses, you will have to budget a reserve for amortized costs. Many items either have a useful or functional lifespan based on time, usage, and where you are cruising. Items in this category would include things like exterior paint on the top sides and cabin, which is typically good for six to 10 years, depending on the climate where you are operating and to an even greater extent, your maintenance practices. Engines and generators typically have a useful life of 10 to 15,000 hours. Of course, this is engine dependent, how well they are maintained and operated. Essentially, the useful life of an engine can be measured in either run hours or how many gallons of fuel you have cycled through them. We figure $1 per hour of run time per engine for operating maintenance, which includes oils, filters, belts, impellers, etc. And in terms of replacement, we reserve $2 per hour of runtime per generator and $5 per hour for the main engine. Although we spent 25 years with our original bridge electronics, these days you are probably better to think in terms of six or seven years for a Garmin product 
and 10 to 12 years at the Furuno level of marine electronics. Heating and air conditioning has an enormous number of variables, but heat pumps and chillers probably have a duty cycle of about 20,000 hours. This is a lot of time if you are in a moderate climate, but if you are near the tropics, this only amounts to about five years of continuous duty. Here again, the quality of the original equipment, its installation and maintenance practices can have a dramatic effect on longevity and on your pocketbook. Interior soft coverings, depending on the quality, selection, use and abuse, are typically good for seven to 10 years. And finally, let's discuss resale value. This is almost impossible to ballpark, but the final sales price and liquidity is gonna be largely dependent on the economy at that time, the boat's pedigree, the builder's reputation, styling, layout, the build material, how well the boat was maintained, and the overall condition of the underpinnings of the boat. In other words, your boat selection, along with a well thought out, systematic and dedicated approach to maintaining your boat, will also have a significant impact on what the boat will bring when you decide to sell it. Next, after considering the boat's mission statement and budget, we can narrow down the boat's size, tonnage, and style. First, let's start with a deep understanding and appreciation that the two biggest factors for sea kindliness on a boat, which we think of as comfort, are going to be the boat's length and its tonnage. If nothing else in this episode resonates with you, this is the key takeaway, length and tonnage. Those are the two dominant factors for how comfortable your boat will be at sea. Next, depending on what geographic areas you are intending to cruise, the draft can be a limiting factor. So if you want to cruise the Bahamas, draft will be a bigger consideration than if you are cruising in the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast part of the United States, or just about anywhere in Europe. Oasis draws nine and a half feet, and for cruising the West and East Coast of the United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, or Northern Europe, this has rarely posed any problem for us. Third, Depending on where your home port is, as distinguished from your hailing port, the boat's length, beam, draft, and or mast height might be a limiting factor due to available dock space, harbor depths, or bridges. Fourth, under the heading of plan ahead, I've found that many boaters ignore or minimize the necessity and reality for needing crew, be they paid or unpaid. I'm not sure if this is due to a failure of imagination or the unwillingness to admit that although we might want to do everything alone, it often isn't advisable, possible, smart, or safe. What might be tenable in your 50s or 60s can change dramatically in your 70s and beyond. Most of us would prefer to have the least number in crew. However, the reality of this lifestyle, making offshore passages, needing watch standards, planning, provisioning, meal preparation, and maintaining the boat. Fifth, you'll want to consider the physical space requirements based on need, budget, and personal taste. For each of the staterooms, including the possibility of guests and or crew, the number and location of heads, lockers, storage, the size of the galley, its pantry, refrigeration space, counter space, the aft deck, be it for fishing or for a dining table and chairs, the boat deck for tenders, kayaks, bikes, and other toys, and interior common areas. Six, styling is more than just personal preference. It actually impacts on the efficient use of space, the overall length, the size, and layout of interior spaces, functional access to getting safely ashore, into tenders, and the boat's overall ease of use and livability. In terms of styling, take the difference between a profile with a forward versus aft pilot house. Having your pilot house aft dramatically alters the location of the boat deck from behind the pilot house to forward of the wheelhouse. This impacts your forward view and your ability to easily and safely launch and retrieve your tender or other toys. It also impacts the living arrangement and size of lower staterooms and even the lower aft deck. 
Next, efficiency. From an efficiency perspective, the aft wheelhouse arrangement will also require about a 15% larger boat than a forward pilot house in order to achieve the same interior square footage. This styling choice could be the difference between getting a 60 foot versus a 70 foot expedition trawler to achieve the exact same interior square footage and comparable livability. Another area to be focused on is practicality. It is difficult to articulate what I mean by practicality in this context. It involves not being rigid, taking a disciplined and thoughtful approach, listening to the experience of others, asking lots of questions, and making well-informed and considered decisions. Here are several examples to help illustrate what I mean when it comes to being practical. Clearly, locating the pilot house further aft will produce a more comfortable ride when at sea in bad weather. If you are a commercial boat working 24-7, unable to choose your weather, this would be a more important consideration. However, the reality for us is that with good weather routing, our boats will spend a minimal amount of time at sea in bad weather. Our boat will spend most of its life either at anchor or tied to a dock. Consider that over 30 years on Oasis, we have done 175,000 sea miles on her own bottom and 50,000 miles as deck cargo but she has spent less than two or three percent of her life actually at sea. Assuming that Oasis has been at sea for three percent of its life, we have probably encountered uncomfortable weather less than five percent of the time. So for us, the 99.85 percent solution of going with a forward wheelhouse design was both more efficient and a more practical solution. In thinking about what configuration will be the right boat for you and your family, you don't want to be so focused on the 0.15% of the time that you end up ignoring how the boat will function the other 99.85% of the time. It is literally like stepping over $100 to pick up 15 cents. We once had a customer who spent a small fortune having us install four different ways to produce hot water versus simply installing a second hot water heater. Perhaps the most pointed example would be going with a twin engine versus a single engine setup with a take-home drive. Just consider for a moment that the vast majority of all large commercial ocean-going bulk container and tankers are propelled by a single engine. Next might be the location of the master stateroom. Many owners new to expedition boats want their master stateroom to be at the lowest level of the boat and aft, typically just forward of the engine room. Although this location on the ship is the most comfortable when underway in bad weather, i.e. well less than 1% of the time, you might want to consider having the master stateroom on the main living level, away from guests and crew, halfway between the engine room and the pilot house, with a much better view more situational awareness, quieter, and faster access to every part of the boat. It also has the advantage when you get older, if you are injured, that you can navigate from the entry through the salon, dining, galley to the master stateroom without having to go down or up a flight of stairs. One isn't necessarily better than the other, but it's worthy of some consideration. Having the boat deck forward of the pilot house, like the Norwegian style trawler design, have both a terrific salty look and are super practical if you are loading and offloading cargo onto commercial docks or spending most of your time at sea where you need to keep an eye on your cargo. Conversely, try to visualize the mechanics of what it's going to be like to launch or retrieve your tender in this type of setup. We've had countless hours of entertainment watching this dance on display, and I can tell you that it is impractical, if not impossible, to safely launch, retrieve, or board your tenders with a forward boat deck. Don't forget that you will also need about a 15% larger boat to offset the inefficiencies of this configuration. In the end, impractical decisions come at a huge cost with little or no functional value. When it comes to making smart, thoughtful choices, it is important to distinguish, 
prioritize and create some sort of balance between practicality, probability, and possibility. Next, let's discuss the build material. Taking concrete out of the equation, it really comes down to either wood, metal, or fiberglass. Wood boats have become all but extinct and are now mostly relegated to collectors, museums, or those interested in the nostalgia that comes from these venerable time-honored works of art. Other than for this small niche of rarefied collectors with deep pockets, they have become part of our collective maritime history. Relative to more modern mediums for boat construction, wooden boats are maintenance intensive with only a handful of yards remaining around the world that are knowledgeable enough to know how to work on them. They are prone to rot, seepage, have a finite lifespan, and typically limited interior space due to their old-fashioned design and how they need to be constructed. In terms of metal boats, steel and aluminum boats in the size range covered by us in this episode are typically the choice for those who want to limit their initial outlay, are looking to get more boat for the money, or a more economical way to produce a one-off custom design. To the extent that this might work for you on the way into buying or building an expedition boat, it will cost you far more over the life of the boat in terms of maintenance and resale value. These days, steel and aluminum boats are typically used as the medium for building much larger mega yachts or one-off character boats. For years, metal boats were considered stronger and safer than boats laid up using fiberglass. Clearly, those individuals must have forgotten the sinking of the Titanic, or in more recent times, the $1 billion loss of the Costa Concordia. Unless you are building a small icebreaker, or like the color of rust, or enjoy painting, fiberglass, in my opinion, is the superior material of choice. When it comes to colliding with an uncharted rock, a grounding, or collision, a well-constructed solid fiberglass hull will have a far greater chance of staying afloat and making it back to port than a metal boat. For most of us, fiberglass will be the only way to go for many reasons. First, it is the most common build material used these days for all yachts under 150 feet. Second, it requires the least amount of ongoing maintenance, depending of course on the initial build quality and reputation of the builder. Third, it is not subject to galvanic corrosion or electrolysis. Fourth, fiberglass is a better insulator than metal, so there will be a lot less sweating and or condensation. And fifth, when you decide to sell your boat, the audience of buyers will be 20 times that of a steel or aluminum boat. Therefore, for the purposes of this episode, we are going to assume that most expedition yachts in our size range will be constructed using fiberglass, also known as GRP, or glass reinforced resin. Next, let's talk a little bit about the importance of the builder, starting with the shipyard's experience. I can't stress enough the importance and role that the builder plays in determining the final outcome and if you will end up with a well-founded expedition boat. A boat is little more than a collection of thousands of parts and pieces assembled with tens of thousands of skilled man hours of labor. It is the quality of this composition that will determine the boat's reputation, its pedigree, and lineage. The bones of whatever boat you end up buying will be defined by the quality, experience, integrity, and reputation of the builder. Here are a few items to keep in mind. For how many years has the shipyard been building these types of long-range expedition vessels? Building this experienced team is measured in decades, not in years. Is the company still under the same ownership? And or how long has the current management team been working at the shipyard? I know of many builders who have gone broke or sold their company where the only thing that remained of the original yard was the name. Ford used to have a slogan which read, the quality went in before the name went on. Well, around the time of the Ford Pinto, which had a tendency to blow up on impact, we used to say the name went on before the quality went in. 
You'll want to be careful of any yard these days to make sure that the same people that built the quality reputation of that yard are still the people who are working at that yard. Next is to check the average length of employment of the yard crew, especially their leads in the fiberglass, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, metal, and paint departments. After an economic downturn like we experienced in 2010 or the pandemic, many of these yards have survived in name only, but it will take years for them to truly recover and rebuild their workforce. Also keep in mind that even with an experienced yard, you never want to be the first boat off any production line. So the whole number of your boat matters. One of my closest friends with more than 50 years of boating experience has said to me that he would never buy a boat that is one of the first 10 hulls of any model. Personally, I would say the first nine hulls as both my Hinkley sailboat and Oasis were hull number 10. But that said, his point should be taken to heart. Next would be integrity. What is the yard's approach to the overall build quality, systems and material? What policies, practices and procedures does the, does the yard employ in terms of a discipline regimen towards testing and quality control? How well are the hull, interior walls, plumbing, air conditioning and decks connected and insulated? What is the craftsmanship, pride and quality when it comes to plumbing, electrical, metal fabrication, cabinetry, painting, engineering, and systems design. Are all major systems well documented and are they accessible and serviceable? What grade of stainless steel do they use? Are all the windows laminated and or tempered and sized to withstand heavy seas? Are wire and plumbing runs neatly organized, labeled, and accessible? If this kind of integrity wasn't incorporated into the original build of the boat, no amount of money or time can correct these issues. Integrity is the collective sum of all these details. Next, let's discuss the reputation of the shipyard. This would apply to the reputation of the shipyard, any specifically identified individual boat, and if we are looking at a used boat, how well it has been maintained by the previous owners. Shipyards reputations are not linear or static. The reputation of a boat is only as good as the people who build the boat, and in the case of a used boat, a combination of the builder and then how well it was maintained. We live in a boom and bust world where reputations wax and wane over time, with few yards being able to weather all these storms. I've known very good yards that have undergone ownership, management, and crew changes equal to the number of boats they have worked on. The name of the yard may remain the same, but what comes out the back door can be a completely different mammal. A yard's reputation takes at least a decade under consistent management and ownership to mature and to be considered reputable. Don't be afraid to ask questions, to speak with other owners, dig deeper, and do your due diligence. Finally, detail. So how important are the details and how much do they really matter? Most buyers are taken in by the curb appeal and the initial wow factor of the exterior of the boat along with its fancy interior. As a former custom home builder and boat builder, we understand that to a large extent, what we are selling is the sizzle, not the steak. This makes it all the more important that you step back and look at the builder's reputation and if it is a used boat, how well this boat was maintained. Once you find a boat which meets the criteria we've been talking about, you will want to visually survey the engine room, bilges, access ways, electrical panels, and to crawl back behind the dash panels on the bridge. The question that really matters is what is under the surface and behind these displays. Examples of these items are too numerous to list, but here are just a few examples in no particular order of importance as to the kind of things that I would be looking at. Although difficult to assess, I would certainly want to understand the overall build quality and fiberglass work on the boat. Is it a cord or solid hull? If coring material was used, what kind of material and where was it used? From a strength perspective, how thick is the layup schedule and how were the decks, bulkheads and watertight compartments fabricated and glassed together? 
What grade of stainless steel was used throughout the boat? Was it 304, 316, or 316L? Is the prop shaft Aquamet 22 or just regular stainless? They all shine up the same, especially when new, but ongoing maintenance of these items over time can be dramatically different. In terms of wiring, I'd want to know if the boat was wired with all mil-spec, tinned, insulated, and shielded wire. Are wireways accessible? And are pull cords there for adding new wires? Are there accurate electrical diagrams or schematics? What is the quality of the hoses, the piping, welds, layout, and design of the plumbing system for fuel, hydraulics, salt water, potable water, air, high pressure, and waste? Is all the plumbing accessible and, where necessary, properly insulated and isolated? Here again, are there up-to-date schematics? How were the fuel, water, gray, black, lube, and waste oil tanks fabricated? Do the tanks have large removable access or inspection panels and, where necessary, internal baffles? Under no circumstances do you want a boat with integral tanks. Next, what is the integrity of the boat's watertight compartments? I'll talk more about this later on, but watertight means just that. All penetrations to other compartments have been fully sealed. Have the doors, hatches, and possibly even the windows been sized to take into account the possibility of having to remove and replace an engine. Next, how easy is it to visualize, inspect, access, service, and repair the engines, water makers, air conditioning, heating, pumps, motors, electronics, galley appliances, washer, dryer, etc. When I say easy, I'm not referring to any portion of the engine room where you have to crawl on all fours to work on equipment like a water maker, a generator, electronics, etc. This will get old very quickly. So this is just a starting point and the list goes on from here. But the point is that you can't allow the pretty surface treatments to distract you from looking under the hood and taking into consideration what this boat is going to truly be like to live with and maintain for the next 10, 20, or hopefully 30 years. It's okay to hope that everything will work out, but assume that sooner or later, everything is going to break and at the worst possible time. So ask yourself how easy it will be to diagnose and repair the problems when that issue inevitably occurs. So now that we have discussed your intended mission statement, budget, size, tonnage, and style, the material that the boat is built out of, and the builder, let's move on to another key aspect of a long-range expedition boat, that being its range. Range is primarily going to be a function of the boat's efficiency, which once past the boat's hull speed is a function of weight and horsepower, and its fuel capacity. The easiest way to define range for our application is that the minimum standard of range is mission critical in terms of your being able to make the desired offshore passage so you can safely reach your intended destination. So once again, we come back to defining what is the boat's mission statement. It's also a good idea to understand that these days, uh, boat builders are in a fight for the next sale and just about always one boat away from insolvency. Their job is to sell boats, and so they are notorious for putting it nicely, stretching their boat's range. It's your job to separate the wheat from the chaff. Since for all intents and purposes, every boat's fuel capacity is fixed, the only real user-controlled variable will be your boat's speed through the water. Picking the weather and changing your boat's speed are really the only way in which you can have an impact on your boat's range. Slowing the boat's speed will increase your efficiency and your range, but this too comes at a price which might not be readily apparent. The most obvious trade-off in reducing your boat speed will be to increase the amount of time that you will be at sea. Here's a quick example. Let's assume that you normally cruise at 1500 RPM, making good a speed of 9.2 knots and burning 10 gallons an hour. So if you were making a non-stop 3000 mile passage, say Panama to San Diego, it would take you 325 hours at 9.2 knots. That's 3,000 miles divided by your speed per hour of 9.2. At 10 gallons per hour, you would burn 3,250 gallons of fuel. 
Now, if you were to reduce your engine speed by 20% or 300 RPM from 1500 RPM down to 1200 RPM, you would reduce your burn rate of fuel by about 30% or from 10 gallons an hour to seven gallons per hour. At 1200 RPM, your new speed will be somewhere around 7.4 knots or 19% slower. So you have reduced your speed by 19% for a 30% reduction in fuel burn. However, at the slower speed, it will now take you an additional 75 hours or about three days longer to make the same passage. What was once a 325 hour trip will now be a 400 hour passage. But your main engine fuel consumption will drop from 3,250 gallons to 2,850 gallons. Your total fuel savings will be about 400 gallons or 13%. Another way of stating this is that by slowing your boat 19%, you will effectively increase your boat theoretical range by 13%. However, there are a few mitigating factors which you need to consider. Generating electricity, especially if you are running air conditioning or heating, will burn somewhere around one gallon per hour. So in the example given above, at the slower speed, you will be spending an additional three days at sea, so you will burn an additional 75 gallons of fuel running your generator, which will reduce your fuel savings from 13% down to 10%. Assuming that your stabilizers were sized for your normal cruising speed, there will be a noticeable reduction in their effectiveness at the slower speed. From a comfort and safety point of view, there are some direct correlations between the boat's stability and the crew's endurance, their functionality, and fatigue. Your rudder or rudders were also sized much like your stabilizers for your normal operating speed. So at slower speeds, they too will be less functional, forcing your autopilot to work harder, which can also impact on the boat's efficiency, its speed, comfort, and time at sea. There are some other direct costs for the three additional days at sea, which are not insubstantial in terms of additional hours on your main engine, your generator, autopilot, water maker, and runtime on all your navigational equipment. There are also some indirect costs worth considering, like three additional days at sea will also mean 25% more crew time, which can be expensive depending on your crew. It'll cost you in terms of food, water, fatigue, and not least on the cook's morale. Perhaps from my point of view, and most importantly, would be the safety implications of 25% more time at sea. This spells a lot more risk, especially when it comes to weather forecasting accuracy at the tail end of your passage. The accuracy of weather forecast degrades over time. So now you will have added three full days to the exposure and risk in terms of weather forecast, plus the risks associated with mechanical, electrical, or human breakdowns. And if you have a significant other, the risk that this adventure might be their last adventure. If you are married and own a yacht, I don't have to tell you how important this factor is or how much that is going to cost you if they are not happy. Another item to keep in mind is fuel reserve. It probably goes without saying that when you consider a boat's range, you will want to keep the greater of a 15 to 20% fuel reserve or whatever your boat requires in terms of stability. Encountering bad weather when you are at the end of a journey and light on fuel is not where you want to find yourself. Next is in terms of thinking about fuel for passage making, there's also thinking about fuel in terms of cruising. Range is only one component to consider when deciding on your desired fuel capacity. An equally important and easily overlooked consideration when it comes to fuel capacity is convenience, reducing wasted time, reducing your cost per gallon, avoiding expensive dockage, and giving you peace of mind when faced with unforeseen situations. So in terms of convenience, Fueling can be a time-consuming endeavor, especially when you are taking on thousands of gallons. We typically take on fuel two or three times per season, mostly having to do with adding tonnage and to lower our CG before making an offshore passage versus the necessity to refuel. In terms of time, 
I recall several years ago when making an 1100 mile offshore passage, a boat we were traveling with had to stop to fuel, which cost them 60 additional miles going in and coming out of port, and they ended up missing the weather window, which ultimately cost them three additional days. By planning our fuel in advance, we can arrange to fuel at 80 gallons a minute versus 15 or 20 gallons a minute which makes a huge difference when you're taking on several thousand gallons. Back in 2007, while we were cruising in Europe, fuel prices were about $10 a gallon. We were able to take a 140 mile detour from Sicily down to Malta, where we refueled for $4 a gallon. We hold just shy of 5,000 gallons, so I'll let you do the math on a $6 per gallon savings. When you are taking on fuel in quantity, you can negotiate significant discounts. Another advantage to packing a lot of fuel is that it can save you thousands of dollars of dockage. There are many places on the East Coast and in the Mediterranean where dockage is insanely expensive. I'm talking north of $8 per foot per night. We have anchored out for months at a time without being overly concerned about our fuel reserves. And finally, I guess I would talk about something known as the black swan event. Another not so obvious advantage of carrying a lot of fuel is being prepared for the unexpected. Most of us always have in the back of our minds that our boats represent a sort of safe haven or portable Swiss bank account in case of a natural disaster, another 9-11, a pandemic, or Putin decides that he wants to test the theory of mutually assured destruction. I almost always leave Oasis with, with full fuel tanks for exactly this reason. Plus, full fuel tanks have the added benefit of there being less chance of condensation building up in the tanks over the winter months. Next, let's talk about speed. So back when I decided to transition from sail to power, it took time for me to realize and fully appreciate that speed is antithetical when considering a serious expedition vessel. I am sure that we have all heard the term hull speed. An overly simplified understanding of a boat's hull speed will be the maximum potential speed that the boat can attain without starting to come out of the water. For a boat to go faster than its theoretical hull speed, it literally needs to climb out of its own hole, sit more on top of the water than in the water, and provide less wetted surface along the hull. So how is this accomplished? It's really pretty simple and straightforward. You have to make the boat lighter, add an enormous amount of horsepower, and flatten the shape of the bottom to create more of a planing hull. There are only a few ways you can make a boat lighter. You need to build the boat with lighter weight composite cord materials, shrink the size of the fuel and water tanks to bare minimum, remove the ballast, and use the lightest weight components throughout the build of the boat. The only way to add massive amounts of horsepower without adding excessive weight is to use light duty, high horsepower, fuel guzzling engines with low endurance ratings. When it comes to rough weather, all boats will consider reducing speed. However, when it comes to these relatively lightweight go fast boats, they are forced to slow down far sooner and far more than a heavy displacement expedition boat. To make matters worse, keep in mind that all these go-fast boats have rudders and stabilizers sized for their maximum cruising speed, which means that when they are forced to slow down, say by 50% or even 60%, their rudders and stabilizers can become dangerously ineffective. Since we are only considering true long-range, high-endurance, solidly-built expedition boats. We are talking about a high-tonnage boat with a full displacement hull. This will understandably limit our top speed to its hull speed, calculated as 1.34 times the square root of the waterline length. I've done the math on this countless times, and it always comes out more or less the same. Even at twice the speed and five times the fuel burn, there is almost no time savings when you factor in that on a percentage of their passage, they will not be able to make their rated speed, that they will be forced to detour for refueling and will spend significant more amount of time 
performing maintenance. From just about any rational perspective, cost, comfort, size, safety, noise, vibration, increased maintenance times, or the environment, these boats simply can't function as long-range expedition vessels with any endurance or efficiency. Indeed, what really underscores this point is that in the last 15 years, we have noticed that virtually all these so-called fast boats are now traveling at or below their hull speed. Next, let's talk a little bit about efficiency. Hull efficiency is another area that shouldn't be overlooked or underappreciated. Not all hull designs are created equally, and many have unique pros and cons. Since I'm obviously most familiar with Oasis, I will use it as an example. At 1550 RPM, which is our standard cruising speed, Oasis makes good a speed through the water of 9.2 knots and burns 10 gallons an hour without taking into account the generator which works out to 1.08 gallons per nautical mile. Most boats in this size range with similar horsepower and fuel burn will make good a speed through the water of somewhere around 8.4 knots. The difference between 8.4 knots and 9.2 knots may not seem like very much, but when transiting between Southern California and Seattle, the difference is measured as one full additional day at sea or when you're crossing the Gulf of Alaska at 350 miles, the difference is between 38 and 43 hours to make that passage. These differences can be significant when it comes to weather routing, maintenance cost, and fuel over the life of the boat. Next, let's discuss single versus twin engines. So this topic feels to me a bit like discussing religion or politics, with most people being pretty dug in. Everything else being equal, I would be a fan of twin engines, but unfortunately, as life would have it, everything is not equal. Twin engines literally doubles your maintenance time, it doubles your spares parts inventory of filters and parts, it reduces the overall efficiency, due in part to the additional drag caused by the second shaft, struts, propeller, and rudder. It reduces the ship's range and its fuel efficiency by about 20%. It increases your overall operating costs, maintenance costs, and negatively impacts on the engine room layout and access to service and inspect your engines, which in turn will require more time in performing routine engine room checks and maintenance. Twin engines also means much smaller running gear, which is far more susceptible to being damaged by a log or grounding. Most expedition yachts these days have a bow and stern thruster, so there is no advantage in terms of maneuverability. After 20 years on our single engine sailboat, 30 years on Oasis, and for all the reasons I just stated, I come down on the side of a well-conceived take-home system with a single engine for propulsion. If you take a step back and think about it, there is a reason that most of the world's tankers and freighters are single engine. In 30 years and 170,000 actual sea miles on Oasis, we have only had to use our take-home drive one time for about 30 minutes, which I described in detail in episode two, part two of this series. Next, let's talk about the advantages of a bulbous bow. Generally speaking, for a boat in our size range, a bulbous bow will serve to increase the fuel efficiency by 17 to 22%. It also dampens the pitching motion of the boat increases the boat's theoretical hull speed by between one quarter and one third of a knot and is useful in trimming the boat from bow to stern. In the case of Oasis, at today's cost of fuel, that would translate into a savings of about $150,000 over the life of the boat. Next, let's discuss a little bit on maintenance costs. Overall efficiency and fuel consumption impacts the life of our engines maintenance cost per mile, range, downtime for maintenance and fueling, and is directly correlated to the total operating cost. Although not determinative, efficiency is an important factor and certainly worth your consideration. In conclusion here, all boats are a compromise. Having a realistic understanding and appreciation of the trade-offs between speed, range, stability, comfort, efficiency, and quality 
will go a long way towards helping you set your priorities and find a boat that is right for you. From my perspective, in this class of boat, your goal should be to enjoy the process while feeling safe and comfortable. Stability is an important consideration for both safety and comfort. So in addition to length and tonnage, which we have already talked about in terms of a sea kindly boat, stability also involves the boat's center of gravity and its riding moment. The easiest way to conceptualize center of gravity in terms of stability is to think about it when you are on the boat and it starts rolling, at what point are you gonna ask yourself, is the boat gonna right itself or is it gonna roll over? If you take a moment and think about that, you will have a full appreciation for the center of gravity and the writing moment and its importance. Another way of thinking about this is if the boat were to roll 90 degrees onto its side, will it want to right itself so that it is floating right side up or upside down? I personally like to think of stability as the ship's ability to return to its upright position after being heeled over due to any combination of wind, waves, and other forces. So that takes us to inherent stability. There are a lot of factors that go into determining a boat's stability, like its center of gravity, draft, superstructure, tenders, load level, which for us typically just mean fuel and water. There is no way to make this assessment from just looking at a boat. Another form of stability is through active stabilizers or paravanes, but both of these assume that you haven't lost your propulsion and that you are making way and that these systems are fully functional. External stabilization is not a replacement for inherent stability, since they could break down while underway or lose efficiency by your slowing down. I cover this in greater detail in parts of episode two, where we discuss this under the heading of weather routing and vessel preparedness. Keep in mind also that your vessel's stability is constantly changing throughout a long voyage as you burn fuel, make and use water. So you don't want a boat that is overly reliant on fuel or water tankage for the boat's stability. There are several examples which I can think of where otherwise reputable yards mistakenly built a boat which turned out to be unstable when light on fuel. For the lucky owners, they found this out before going to sea. You don't want to find out what inherent stability means seven days into an offshore passage when you are getting light on fuel and the weather starts to deteriorate. This is both a serious and life-threatening risk, something you never want to discover after you have bought the boat or after you have put to sea. There are literally dozens of NTSB reports that help underscore the importance of stability. Next, let's talk a little bit about overstability. So boats can also be too stable, the classic example being a flat bottom boat or catamaran. These boats have tremendous initial stability when docked, anchored, or operating in relatively calm water, but their ultimate stability goes downhill very quickly, like when one pontoon starts to come out of the water. Overly stable boats also tend to have a very fast, snappy riding moment, producing a violent motion when riding themselves. These typically do not make good expedition vessels. Next, let's talk about comfort. Every boat has its own motion and each person's internal wiring will experience this differently. However, the difference between a comfortable and uncomfortable ride will make the difference in how quickly those on board get seasick, their willingness to make longer passages, and the ability of all on board to operate at closer to peak efficiency. This is not something that you will want to underappreciate or overlook in considering what will be the right boat for you, your situation, and mostly your significant other. In terms of passive stabilization, passive stabilization would be items such as bilge keels and paravanes. Bilge keels are great so long as they are either molded into the hull or strong enough to support the weight of the boat. They are not, in my mind, a substitute for active stabilization. Paravanes are very cool looking and can also provide effective stabilization when at anchor. Paravanes can also be somewhat unwieldy to manage, to launch, deploy, retrieve, and to control. So we affectionately refer to them as widow makers. Next, let's talk about active stabilization. Active stabilizers these days come in two flavors, the more common and time-tested hydraulic fin style 
and the newer centrifugal stabilizers. Traditional active fin stabilizers by venerable companies like NIAD and TRAC are well-designed, time-tested, and I would say essential equipment when it comes to both comfort and safety. A seasick crew is by definition an unsafe, not to mention unpleasant, crew. Centrifugal stabilizers are relatively new on the scene. Other than anecdotally, I don't have any first-hand experience using them. Years ago, I did stop by the Seakeepers booth at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, and I recall that for Oasis, they thought we would need three or four of their largest units. These systems require about an hour to fully spool up to 9,000 RPM, so no rushing out of the harbor in the morning. They also produce a high-pitched whine inside the boat at about 70 decibels. They consume enough power to require a generator running and have a relatively short lifespan when compared to conventional hydraulic fin stabilizers. Stabilizing an expedition yacht is simply too mission critical to risk several hundred thousand dollars on something that hasn't been time tested in thousands of boats over dozens of years or where you can't reasonably expect to get them serviced when you're away from the dealer who sold them to you. We have already touched on a variety of peripheral safety issues, but now I want to drill down on some specific aspects, both in terms of the construction of the boat and features within the boat that can have a direct and dramatic impact on safety. The following will be several specific areas and features in the build of the boat, which are important to us and which you will want to consider in the selection of a long range expedition vessel. So first, let's start with below the waterline. And let me start by saying that without hesitation, I would never be interested in any offshore expedition boat with a cord hull, period, full stop. I would be looking only for a boat with a solid fiberglass hull with a minimum thickness of 7 eighths to 1 inch thick, a steel shoe running the entire length of the keel, and a stem band. Although not essential, a sea chest for raw water with protective grate and clean out from inside the boat is definitely a nice feature, both for maintenance and for safety, but only if it is properly designed and installed by an experienced and knowledgeable builder. Another area of importance is the adequate size of hydraulic stabilizers. The key here is that when you really need these stabilizers, it's in rough weather when you might not be running at your normal cruising speed. So to be truly effective, when you need them the most, they should be sized to provide a high degree of effective stabilization down to 70% of the boat's normal cruising speed. The last thing you want to learn when you are forced to slow down due to bad weather is that your stabilizers are undersized. For following seas, maneuvering in tight situations and in harbor operations, a large rudder or rudders is an important consideration. As a rule of thumb, you will want to be able to turn your boat within a radius of two times the boat length. The rudder should be protected with upwards of a two inch steel guard or shoe, as this area is both highly vulnerable and otherwise unsupported. This is especially the case when backing down, sitting on the hard at low tide, or hauling out. Hydraulic bow and stern thrusters are a super nice feature to have provide great maneuverability in tight spaces. Uh, they reduce the need for crew. They provide you with greater flexibility in terms of docking and challenging conditions and will go a long way towards reducing your stress. I would add to this that all too often I have seen thrusters installed which are undersized. My suggestion would be that thrusters should be sized so that you can push the boat off the dock or hold the boat on the dock in 25 knots of sustained winds. I have yet to meet the captain who said that he wished he had smaller thrusters. Next, let's talk about the top sides from the water line up. You will want large rub rails with solid stainless steel chafe guards. This may seem obvious, except that many yards these days use the less expensive hollow versus solid metal guards. These hollow metal guards are hard to detect at first glance but very easy after the first time that the boat lays on a piling. 
Hollow rails are much lighter, easier to install, and about 15% the cost of solid rails. They are essentially good for decoration, and because of the weight consideration found on most boats designed to operate above their hull speed. Another item to think about are freeing port doors, which is an important consideration to reduce the flooding on your decks, hatches, and to keep tons of seawater off your decks. For your safety and peace of mind, reasonably high bulwark heights, railings, handholds, tread depths, and riser heights on exterior stairs, placement of boarding doors for access to the dock and to tenders are basic considerations and all too easily overlooked. You will want to take into account your age, the age of your family, guests, crew members, children, pets, and any special other needs. When it comes to your boarding doors, take into account a variety of different docking situations, like side tie to floating versus fixed docks, commercial docks, docking stern to and in the Mediterranean, and providing safe access to tenders and or kayaks. On the west coast of the United States, you have floating docks, which are typically 18 to 24 inches off the water. On much of the southern and eastern coast of the United States, between Florida and Virginia, you have fixed docks four to five feet off the water at mean tide. And in the Mediterranean, you will use an aft boarding ramp to a dock which is typically five to eight feet above the waterline. Each of these situations presents its own unique challenge and potential daily hazard when alongside. When underway or at sea, well-designed and adequate handholds, stairs, railings, and bulwark heights will go a long way towards keeping your stress low and everyone safe. Next, back to watertight compartments, which we touched on earlier. Survivability of a damaged yacht is in large measure dependent on the strength and integrity of its watertight compartments. At a minimum, these need to include a forward collision bulkhead, a watertight compartment for stabilizers and sonar bay, for your engine room, and for your steering compartment. Keep in mind that all these compartments represent the boat's weakest and most vulnerable points. Each of these compartments needs to be completely watertight. That means watertight doors and hatches. The design goal of having watertight compartments is to help ensure the boat's survival with any one of these compartments flooded. Here again, I have seen boats built by reputable yards boasting about their watertight compartments only to discover large penetrations that were never sealed up during construction. As the Russian proverb reminds us, trust but verify. Next, flooding. Primary and secondary bilge pumps should be designed to dewater any compartment at a rate equal to or greater than the larger through hull penetration in that compartment. Early warning alarms for high water in all compartments are essential. The use of a sea chest minimizes the number of through hull fittings and provides a single shutoff point if a leak develops. We go into this subject in greater depth in part two of episode two, I would encourage you to watch this episode on vessel preparedness. Next would be fire alarms and an automatic fire suppression system with manual override coupled with automatic fan shutoff and dampers to seal the engine room are essential. I'm a believer in having viewing ports in your engine room access doors so you can visually see inside the compartment before opening the door. Next, serviceability. Having engines Valves, hoses, motors, and other less critical components like your refrigeration, oven, washer, and dryer, which are buried or inaccessible, will pretty much assure you that they won't be properly inspected and or maintained. This all but guarantees their failure and poses a significant safety risk. Finally, uh, abandoned ship supplies, also something we've talked about in other episodes. So a U.S. Coast Guard and Solus A offshore life raft of appropriate size with an insulated floor and a toroidal stability device, we now carry two Category 1 EPIRBs. Now let's talk about tankage. So this would be tankage for fuel, water, gray and black tanks, lube and waste oil tanks, possibly a bulbous bow tank, and hot water heaters. When discussing fuel capacity for an expedition boat, I would think you'd want to pack enough fuel to manage a Pacific or Atlantic crossing. So a good place to start might be 
with sufficient tankage for about a 2200 mile passage plus a 20% reserve. Another consideration for tankage might be taking into account how much time you will be running your generator. Another might be consideration of cruising versus passage making. We have found ourselves in situations while cruising in the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, and Europe, where ports were either not available, affordable, or didn't have adequate power. Our fuel reserves are sufficient to have allowed us to spend five months cruising between Majorca and Malta, while spending three months at anchor in France and Italy, without any need to buy fuel while in the EU. Fuel capacity is worth thinking about, and not just in terms of cruising range. Your water tankage is an important consideration. My preference would be for a minimum of 800 to 1,000 gallons. Either because of weight, space, or cost, most boat builders like to play down the importance by substituting an owner-supplied water maker. This is not a substitute for water tank capacity. These units are expensive to run at about 20 cents per gallon, quite fussy, prone to all sorts of limitations and failures. Generally speaking, you can't run your water maker efficiently in Alaska due to the low water temperature and glacial silt, or near the outlets of large rivers. A water maker should not be run in port, especially in third world countries where their sewage treatment is questionable. We had a situation this past winter where the dock water was shut off for several weeks and we couldn't run our water maker and had to rely on tank water. We have had similar experiences when hauled out with no access to potable water. Next, let's touch on the black and gray tanks. I'm less concerned with the gray and black tankage capacity, especially when underway or offshore. For all the obvious reasons, this becomes a much more significant problem when you are out of the water and on the hard or in a restricted harbor. I encourage you to uh, plumb these tanks with a crossover manifold and to use an industrial strength diaphragm pumps like the Desert Storm pumps made by Edson. A crossover valving setup has two advantages. First, it potentially allows you to double the capacity of each individual tank, which will give you more headroom, no pun intended. And secondly, if either pump were to fail, you can still evacuate the tanks with the other pump. In terms of the bulbous bow tank, this is a good option for providing additional tankage for fuel or water. In our case, we use it to hold 500 gallons of seawater so that we can trim the boat for when we're in port or when we're on long passages. In terms of the lube and waste oil tanks, my feeling here is that you will want to have sufficient lube oil to last your entire cruising season. It is also a good idea for your waste oil tank to be at least 10% larger than your lube oil tank. We size our lube oil tank at 58 gallons of lube oil, which permits us to take on a full 55 gallon drum of oil. Our waste oil tank is 65 gallons. You'll also want a high grade lube oil pump with large enough hoses, manifold and fittings so as not to overly restrict the flow. Air-driven pumps are best for this application, but a quality-made commercial electric pump will work as well. We also use our lube oil pump to pre-lube the main engine, uh, to pump out our waste oil tank or take on fresh lube oil. Consider setting up your waste oil lube tank so that you can also conveniently drain used oil filters and fuel filters when performing routine maintenance. In terms of hot water tanks, when it comes to boats, I am still squarely in the camp of preferring a hot water tank over a tankless water heater. They provide far greater endurance, reliability, flexibility, a hot water reserve, and is far easier to manage your shore power. If you need 50 gallons of hot water, my suggestion is to break this into two 25 gallon tanks, each being wired to a separate shore power bus with a recirculating system. The recirculating system will provide instant hot water, thereby conserving water, and provide 50 gallons of hot water with either one or both tank heaters switched on. It also provides a backup water heater by having a second tank. Next, let's discuss a few of the practical considerations for your engine room, mechanical spaces, and equipment. When it comes to mechanical equipment, you are primarily looking to be sure 
that you are dealing with high endurance, robust, and continuous duty motors, pumps, and compressors. You are also looking for equipment that can be readily serviced wherever you intend to cruise. My preference is for the older style mechanical engines as they are more serviceable. The newer electronic engines require sophisticated diagnostic equipment and the ability to dial 911 if you can't fix the problem. If you are looking for a used boat, then you need to ensure that all equipment, including spares, have been well maintained. On the electrical side, in terms of generating your own power, you're looking for a properly sized, high quality pair of generators. It is better to have both generators the same size for redundancy, spare parts, and ease of maintenance. If you are looking at a used boat, then how well have these engines been cared for is key. In terms of shore power, depending where you are cruising, you might find more power options available to you with dual 50 amp versus a single 100 amp shore power cord. Keep in mind as well that almost all new marinas, especially those in the United States, are now required to have low level 30 milliamp ground fault circuit interrupters, also known as GFCIs. So the individual circuit breakers you are tapping into are typically set to trip at 10 milliamps. It is almost impossible not to trip these breakers unless you install an isolation transformer. Alternatively, if you are planning on traveling outside of North America to an area, say, that has 50 versus 60 cycle power, you might want to consider going with a frequency power converter, like the ones made by AC Power Systems, which would solve your GFCI problem on shore power and automatically provide frequency change, isolation, and the necessary voltage buck or boost. Here are some general comments I have on your engine room. Uh, I would be looking for an engine room that, as mentioned earlier, is full stand-up head height for working on the main engines, generators, water maker, air conditioning, pumps, raw water strainer, and the electrical panel. At a minimum, you will want a suitable engine room workbench, utility sink, good AC and DC lighting, tool and small parts storage, a primary and secondary watertight access door. The secondary engine room door is essential for emergency access and for more messy projects so you don't have to go through the boat. As mentioned earlier, doors with a viewing port is a good safety feature. We operate in both hot and cold climates, so both our engine rooms and pump room are climate controlled with heating and air conditioning, which might be something you want to consider as well. Next, in terms of a boat's documentation, it is important to have both repair and parts manuals for all engines, motors, pumps, heating, air conditioning, air handlers, hydraulics, water makers, appliances, and all pilot house electronics. If possible, having up-to-date as-built drawings and schematics are also essential as discussed more in Episode 2, Part 2 on Vessel Preparedness. Here are a few of my priorities and thoughts when it comes to interior spaces and layout. In general, the interior space needs to provide an open, spacious feel while remaining functional, efficient, and to the extent possible, having a degree of flexibility to accommodate both your present and future needs. A good example of this is a couple who buys a boat or builds a boat in their 30s or 40s will be very different than what their needs might be in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's hard to plan for an uncertain future, but it is well worth the effort to do your best to anticipate a few of what these future needs might be. In terms of the pilot house, it needs to have good visibility, be large enough to have ample space for all your intended bridge electronics, displays, and controls, with some unused extra real estate for future expansion and new electronics. My preference is for forward raked windows, which will reduce glare during the day, reflections at night, keep your pilot house much cooler, provide more overhead space for overhead electronics, and the windows will stay cleaner, providing much better visibility. I still personally like having chart drawers and a chart table. Although many of our chart drawers are now shared with reference books and cruising guides. In our application, I like to have comfortable helm seating for two with a dinette table 
port and starboard access doors are essential, a navigation desk, and 360 degree visibility. While on this subject, I can't stress enough the importance of providing generous working space access behind all dashboards, giving you the space, lighting, ventilation, and room for tools to properly work on the electronics. One final thought when it comes to Whizbang state-of-the-art electronics. What you really want here, I think, is reliability, dependability, endurance, and serviceability. As mentioned earlier, for the first 25 years on Oasis, we had commercial Furuno radars and sonar. They always work. Our new Furuno radars have gone from having a 40-page to 400-page manual. These new electronics are great when they're working, but they are worthless on a long expedition yacht if you can't troubleshoot, diagnose, and repair them. You need to also fully understand their interconnectivity and how to work on them. Although I'm very pleased with our new electronics, it was a vertical learning curve and has added a lot more complexity and points of failure. Bottom line, bridge integration is not for the faint of heart. So now let's switch gears and quickly talk about other appliances. The same principle applies here to all your onboard ship's appliances. Basic essentials like your boat's heating system, hot water heating, stove, oven, washer, dryer, etc. should have as few bells and whistles and electronic points of failure as possible. In just the past three weeks this year, I've encountered two boats with diesel heating systems, both of which were waiting for over a week to have new electronics flown in. The boat behind us just limped into port with an electronics problem in their steering system and after a week of trying to get it repaired, have decided to cancel their entire summer's cruising plans as they limp home to get the system repaired. You don't need or want a stove, refrigerator, heating or steering system that needs a computer to diagnose what's wrong with it. You don't need a washer or dryer that has 15 different cycles. You are on a boat with a variety of variable power sources, which is the death of electronics. My advice is to stay focused on the primary considerations of dependability, reliability, and serviceability from anywhere in the world. Next, let's talk about storage space, which is something that we all understand from a common sense perspective, but let me just spend a moment on that subject. For long range expedition yachts, you can't have too much storage space in terms of refrigeration, freezer space, hanging locker, drawers, clothes, hampers, pantry storage, a well-designed and appointed galley, book storage, manuals, a long list of electrical and plumbing parts. As an illustration, we always pre-provision with a six or seven month supply of all our bulky items. So we're going to finish up this episode with going around the outside of the boat, considering what are the important aspects of these exterior spaces, starting with the flybridge and then working our way down. Having a working flybridge is really a matter of personal preference, but certainly not mission critical. A lot depends on your age, agility, ease of access to the flybridge, bridge controls, electronics, protection from the weather, your other control stations and sight lines from around the boat. Keep in mind that when docking from the flybridge, you will be two flights of stairs away from your crew. So you will be of little help when it comes to adjusting fenders or securing lines. You will also be three stories removed from your main engine and generators. So you will likely not be able to hear if the engines are running or worse, if an engine stops running. Loss of physical and sensory contact from the flybridge, especially when close quarter maneuvering or in a docking situation, can have catastrophic implications. Coming off 20 plus years and 60,000 miles on a sailboat, I was convinced that the flybridge would be invaluable. Once again, we don't know what we don't know and I was wrong. It is the least used part of our boat. If you do opt for a flybridge, you'll likely also want to consider adding port and starboard wing controls for throttle, shifting, rudder control, rudder angle indicator, thrusters, depth, wind speed, wind speed direction, VHF communication, a chart plotter, 
and a radar repeater with daylight readable screens. You'll need repeaters for your engine gauges and vessel monitoring system with an alarm enunciator. You'll also need to provide easy access back behind the dash for maintaining all these electronics, along with sun, wind, and rain protection, and the ability to remain in communication with your crew uh, when underway and docking. When operating from the bridge in confined quarters, like a harbor, canal, narrow waterway, or through bridges and locks, you will want a clear, unobstructed walkway from the port to the starboard controls so you can quickly transition back and forth with clear sight lines. Other than perhaps glancing at your radar, chart plotter, engine gauges, and VHF radio, the center helm control will be the least important station on the flybridge. Before moving off this topic, it's of critical importance to be mindful of steep and or unsafe stairs to the flybridge for you, your family, children, elderly parents, and pets. It is important that they have enough tread depth and slope to help facilitate quick and safe access to or from the flybridge. Similarly, at some point, you're going to need to go up the mast or radar arch for routine cleaning, repairs, maintenance, inspections, or adding new equipment. Stair treads, rungs, and platforms should all be finished with some form of aggressive non-skid. Next, let's move to the upper deck consideration, starting with the foredeck. You will need a minimum of two hawse cleats, one port and starboard. However, four cleats is preferable, especially in the Mediterranean and when alongside in heavy weather. We could do an entire episode on anchors and ground tackle. So all I'll say here is that the weight of the chain is as important, if not more important, than the weight or style of anchor. My clear preference is for an on-deck hydraulic winch with at least one shot of chain and 500 feet of cable. A high-pressure washdown system is the most effective and uses the least amount of fresh water and helps to ensure that all salt is removed from the cable and chain when retrieving the anchor. Try to standardize as many pumps and motors as possible. So, in this case, if you can use the exact same high-pressure pump for your water maker as for your high-pressure washdown system, you won't need to carry a spare and you'll be using your backup pump several times a week so that you know that it's working. It's important that any four-deck hatches be large enough that you can comfortably and safely access the compartment and that it has dogs to secure the hatch when underway. The only way to keep this compartment smelling clean and fresh is to have fresh air circulation. We use a simple bathroom vent fan, about $35 from Home Depot, with a separate air inlet and outlet. These fans run continuously 24 seven, and we replace them at Home Depot every seven or eight years. My final thoughts on the four deck are with any boat over 60 tons, uh, you will want a bow warping winch. This is an essential piece of equipment for any size boat when docking in the Mediterranean. For safety, good four deck illumination is essential when out on deck at night, having to handle or adjust dock lines, anchoring or retrieving the anchor. It is also a good idea to install a remote speaker from your VHF radio so you can monitor the radio when you are anchoring or working out on the foredeck. Next, let's move to the boat deck. The boat deck needs to be adequately sized for a single tender or if space permits for two tenders. What is the optimal size of tenders? An 11 foot Novarania with a 15 horsepower engine weighs about 500 to 550 pounds, which is too heavy to use for beach landings and way too small to function as a shore or exploration boat in anything other than ideal weather conditions. Large tenders can provide more comfort, safety, protection from the elements, function as a work platform when washing, polishing, or waxing the boat. They are a good dive or fishing platform, as well as a good pilot boat or for longer range exploration and as an all-around water taxi or pickup truck when ferrying guests with luggage or reprovisioning while at anchor. There are, however, downsides as well to a large tender. 
They require a much bigger, heavier, and more expensive crane with significant load carrying capacity. Launching and retrieving a heavy tender can be problematic in terms of manpower and safety, and if you aren't careful, they can end up in your salon. Keep in mind that if you do decide to take a large tender up on the beach with a falling tide, it is probably going to remain there until the next high tide. Larger tenders can also be problematic in many marinas, which limit the size of boats which can tie up at their dinghy dock. Dual davit arms are the safest, fastest, and easiest way to handle a big tender. Our tender weighs a little over 3,000 pounds, and it is usually in the water 30 seconds after the anchor is down. In fact, it's a lot easier, safer, and quicker for us to launch and retrieve our big tender than it is our small 150-pound Carib inflatable. While on this subject, let me just mention that no expedition yacht should ever be set up where you have to tow your tender. That practice eventually ends up with your having to buy a new tender and countless hours of heartache and needless stress. In a more perfect world, you will want two tenders. A lightweight inflatable, say around 10 foot tender with a small engine for faster deployment beach landings to use as a backup tender or to be used by guests and or crew and to provide more flexibility depending on the application, cruising region, and to have a backup tender in case one of them breaks down. My personal experience has been that on the east coast of the United States, we use our large tender 99% of the time. In Alaska, when we would make a lot of beach landings, we use our small tender most of the time. And in the Mediterranean, the split was 70-30 in favor of the larger tender. The only real reason you needed the small tender is for beach landings, guests, crew, and as a backup. Regardless if you are in the tropics or in high latitudes, you'll at least need one tender that can provide protection from wind, sun, and rain, including a windshield. The tender needs to be of adequate size and weight to be stable, safe, dry, and have passenger carrying capacity in a variety of weather conditions. You'll also need a VHF radio, navigation running lights for running after dark, a depth sounder, GPS and electronic chart plotter so you don't have to carry charts with you and can find your way home if the weather changes or it gets dark. The boat needs to have safe handholds for embarking and disembarking, especially as people get older. It needs a swim ladder, a boat hook, bilge pump, watertight lockers to store supplies like searchlight lines, manuals, a hand pump, chamois, binoculars, spare parts, fire extinguishers, tools, and you need a place to store your anchor. We opted for a diesel versus a gasoline engine, which has provided great reliability, range, and endurance. It also has the advantage of being able to be refueled from the mothership and avoiding the hassle, danger, and space required to store fuel on the boat deck. If you are planning a trip to the Mediterranean, you'll need a passerelle with railings, lifting harness, mounting hardware, wheels on the dock, and a place to store and deploy the passerelle. From our experience, 14 feet is about the shortest practical length for a passerelle in Europe. Other boat deck items you may want to consider could be motor scooters, bicycles, kayaks, jet skis, sailboards, and then deck storage boxes for dive and fishing gear, dive compressor, a folding ladder, extra dock lines, abandoned ship supplies, spare parts for your tenders, and any other toys. Floodlights are also important for conducting safe operations after dark. Now let's move down to the lower aft deck and side decks. Aside from the obvious items, uh, like a dinette table and chairs, you might want to think about items like a wet and drying locker, barbecue, sink, storage for cleaning and boat, washing supplies, a wash down hose reel, retracting shore power cable system, along with an on deck storage location for dock stairs, extension shore power cords, power adapters, docking lines, fenders, fender holders, wash down hoses, smaller lines, 
storage for foul weather gear, and much more. You will also want to provide some protection from sun, wind, and rain, along with general illumination, a hot and cold shower, dock inlet for connecting to dock water, and a primary water filter. Even if you are not going to the Mediterranean, where they all dock with their stern to the quay, you will want two aft-facing hawse cleats with warping winches. Most expedition boats will have at least one, if not two, aft lazarette hatches. Here again, these hatches need to be large enough so that large items like chairs, cushions, fenders, and you yourself can easily and safely uh, get into these spaces. Providing positive ventilation will help eliminate mold and keep these areas dry. You should also have a second engine room access door from the aft deck suitable for dirty projects, emergency access, or carrying out large heavy items to and from the engine room. To my way of thinking, walk around side decks are essential. Lots of builders these days have eliminated one or both of these side decks to create more livable space inside the boat. This is fine for a local cruising yacht, especially if they have crew but it is impractical for an expedition yacht. There is no way to moor in the Mediterranean to set lines, to quickly adjust fenders, to launch, retrieve, or board your tender, unless you're a contortionist, without an access to side decks. Other practical considerations are washing the cabin sides, the hull, and cleaning the windows, which is a weekly, if not daily, uh, occurrence. Walk around side decks also provide additional protection from the sun and rain, which is especially helpful when docking and line handling. Side decks are the locations where you will also want to locate hawse cleats for your forward and aft facing spring lines. Dual cleats on each hawse is a big advantage in permitting more flexibility when securing the boat, adding lines so as not to end up with two lines on one cleat or crossing each other, and to temporarily secure one line from a warping winch while securing the other line to the cleat. Next, let's talk about remote docking stations. So either aft, wing, or boat deck docking stations are key when it comes to docking, especially if you are running light on crew. Unless you want to rely on someone else's audio assessment of what they are seeing or like being stressed, you will want to have your eyes on the situation. When it comes to docking and departing any berth, you will want to have a clear sight line along one or both sides of the boat while being able to see any other boat traffic moving in your direction of travel. If you are planning on traveling to the Mediterranean, you will need to have at least one aft facing docking station, preferably with the ability to remotely control the anchor winch. Regardless as to where these stations are located, whether they're on the flybridge, bridge wing controls, aft upper boat deck station, lower aft deck, you will want to have the following controls at each station. So each docking station needs, at a minimum, to have a shift and throttle control, needs to have bow and stern thruster controls, steering, rudder angle indicator controls. I personally like to have a depth indicator, and I would suggest you consider a wind speed and direction indicator as well. On your aft facing docking station, for backing down, you will need to locate the depth transducer aft of the prop and rudder so you can read the depth when backing down. Keep in mind that you will not get any accurate depth reading if your transducer is located in the slipstream of your prop or thrusters. For perspective, when we thought about switching from sail to power, it took us more than three years from when we embarked on this odyssey to when we finally decided to pull the trigger and start construction on Oasis. We talked to anyone and everyone who would speak with us. We attended countless boat shows and we were blessed to meet many people along the way who were generous with their time, knowledge and experience. We learned something from everyone we spoke with which was instrumental in terms of our avoiding making a major mistake. We also learned something from every boat we set foot on. Learning what you don't want is every bit as important to finding out what you do want. Making a well-informed and thoughtful decision wasn't easy or quick, but the single best investment that we made was taking the time to educate ourselves. 
This part of the process played the pivotal role in our ultimately deciding what boat to build and where to build it. 30 years and 225,000 miles later, it was the best decision we could have made. Every boat represents a series of compromises and trade-offs, which are impossible to factor into your decision without first clearly understanding your mission statement so that you are in a position to assess the attributes and inadequacies of any given vessel. Hopefully, this episode will provide the beginning of a framework for how to approach and evaluate if the boat you are considering is suitable for your needs and will qualify as a well-founded offshore expedition yacht for you and your family. Two final thoughts before I leave you. Uh, if you are planning on buying a used boat, first is to work with a reputable and knowledgeable boat broker. And second is to hire a good, qualified and experienced surveyor. Not to be too cynical here, but I would certainly caution you to recognize that the broker makes money by selling you a boat. In most cases, the broker is not your friend. In terms of surveyors, there are surveyors, and then again, there are surveyors. A good broker and surveyor won't cost you money. They will save you money and are vitally important steps in buying any used boat. To give you some context on a boat like Oasis, a thorough survey would require four to five full man days to perform an inspection. This is the best money you will ever spend and not a step that you want to skip or scrimp on. I've received a lot of requests from viewers to talk more about a variety of different topics. In response to these requests, episode six is now going to cover tips, tricks, and lessons learned in the past and suggestions for what you might want to consider when outfitting a new or used expedition yacht. This should be a fun and interesting episode as we will talk about ideas which you might not have thought about when it comes to some specific engine room features, tools, hardware, diagnostic tools, electrical features that will improve your experience and make life easier. Uh, we will also talk about deck and dock items to facilitate convenience and safety while living aboard your boat in a variety of different parts of the world. So sorry that this ran so long. This actually is gonna replace two or three episodes. So that's partly why it ran over. And I wanna thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of An Achievable Dream for all your comments, suggestions, and support. We look forward to seeing you again in a few months with episode six. And meanwhile, I hope that you all have a healthy and safe adventure and wish you all the best. Take care and thanks again for joining us.